Dwayne Diker and Chris Donovan are here to talk about appellate workflows. Uh, Dwayne is a partner at Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick in Tampa and a past chair of the appellate practice section. Um, Chris is a shareholder at Retzel, in Retzel Anders in Naples um, and the chair elect of the appellate practice section. They're both board certified appellate practitioners and they did a uh, version of this presentation on Dwayne's podcast. If you're interested in all these appellate issues, you should check out the Issues on Appeal podcast that Dwayne hosts. Um, and I really, I asked him uh, and, and Chris if they would consider putting together kind of a COE version of their discussion because it was so interesting. And so I'm really grateful that they were willing to do that and that they're here today. And so please join me in welcoming Chris and Dwayne to talk about appellate workflows. I'm going to go on the other side of you. This Thanks, is kind Joe. Of awkward with two. <laughs> All right, so can you guys hear me? All right. Good afternoon, or is it evening? Are we going to need a ruling on that? It's yeah, evening. it's after five, yeah, so it's maybe it's good out. evening. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. Yeah. It's always fun to be in the after five o'clock slot. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm perfect for this because I teach a class at the local college, and it's Monday nights from 7 to 9.40, so I'm used to speaking to groups of very tired sometimes sleeping people. So. I'm usually eating right now. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Chris and I are honored to be a part of this program, especially the advanced part of the program, because I know there's a lot of people in this room that we probably can't teach anything to about uh, handling appeals. But, and like Joe mentioned, we've done this workflows presentation before. It's going to be kind of abbreviated today. If you want to listen to the whole thing, it's episodes 12 and 15 on the podcast, and you can get two full hours of this. Uh, you just don't get CLE credit, so. Um, the credit here really goes to Chris, though. Uh, Chris is the one who came up with this idea and the one who really has spent a lot of time thinking through appellate workflows. It wasn't something that I had given a lot of thought to, and as it turns out, we talked and we approached things a lot the same way with some differences here and there that we'll point out. But uh, So we're going to go through some of our workflows. I. We want to say up front that we're not saying that this is the way to do it. Uh, you don't have to do it Chris's way. You don't have to do it my way. But the thought is, you know, when we get together, we talk about these kinds of things. It gives you an opportunity to think about what your workflows are and changes that you can make or just, you know, concentrating on the fact that there maybe there is a procedure to follow each time you do an appeal to make sure that you're doing it right and well and efficiently. Uh, we've been here all day, so we know that there is some potential for overlap with some of the uh, previous presenters, so we're going to avoid that as much as we can. We may talk about some of the few things if we think we have something to add, so we'll try not to be too duplicative. And I guess the, the best place to start is at the beginning, and maybe I'm sitting on the keyboard here. You're backwards. Oh. You're pushing nothing. <laughs> Arrows look it's different whether the, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so before we even start writing, uh, there are some pre-briefing considerations, things to think about. Chris, can we talk a little bit about, the very first thing we do is we, we prepare a notice of appeal, right? Are there, are there things that you think about right from the beginning? You know, generally not. I mean, the notice of appeal is actually something that I often I, you know, try to make it as cheap as possible for the client, or, or in this case, it's pro bono, so it's cheap as, as time-wise cheap as possible for you. Is I try to, uh, we have a, you know, the forms in there. The the, the legal assistant should know the, the uh, same process every time. So that's something that that I often have uh, uh, an assistant do, and then I review before it goes out. Uh, the only exception to that is if I think there was somebody that had suggested earlier that if you've got a in a non-final appeal, you've got a pending motion for rehearing, and maybe you want to. Uh, uh, not you want to acknowledge that the fa that fact, but not abandon it, and and let the court know that a motion to relinquish is coming. Maybe drop a little footnote uh, in the notice of appeal to add you know something to, the, to that effect. But otherwise, it's a fairly perfunctory. Thing. And what about and I, I should mention that Chris and I had originally talked about 
you know, how do we narrow this presentation? Because I know some of you are here because you do defending best interest appeals, and, mm -hmm. and those are always as appellee, but some pro bono things that come up through the section are, are as appellants too. So we didn't want to narrow the focus too much. So we're going to talk about, what about when you get a notice of an appeal as an appellee? Yeah. Anything you do at that point? First thing I do is make sure it's timely, because that might be an easy way to get rid of it. But I mean, other than that, uh, no. I mean, I, I try to do as little as possible in the beginning as the appellee. Yeah, I tend to look at, you know, and it's not all the time, but if there are jurisdictional issues, I want to look at them up front. Uh, if there, it's a possibility that it's not a non-final order, like some of the things we've talked about. You know, uh, Jared was talking about motions, and you can file a motion to dismiss an appeal at any time, but I've always felt like if I'm going to bring one, I ought to bring it sooner rather than later. So that's something that I always do when it comes in is, is take a look at the uh, whether there's any jurisdictional arguments. Sometimes the court will bring it up for you, but it's kind of nice. It's also nice for your, just the appearances to your client if you identify something before the court does mm -hmm. and give them a heads up that makes you look like you know what's going on. Uh, what about uh, the record? Well, and that, that it does require a little bit more work uh, in the beginning as the appellant. Uh, often I will either I myself or have my assistant uh, uh, print off a copy of the docket of the trial docket and I'll try to go through and take an initial stab of first seeing if there's any way that I can limit the record because I know as, as uh, uh, staff attorneys they don't want to read uh, a 4,000 page record if there's only three or four operative documents that are really relevant. Um, so if I can do that, great. If not, uh, then you know, I, I'll ha we have standard forms for uh, directions to the court or to the clerk and designations to the court reporter. Also, it's a good time at that point if 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 it's uh, if you have a trial counsel on that. If it was a pro se person, you probably wouldn't have a trial counsel. But if they do, then to chat with them about what are some of the issues uh, that they perceive as being relevant to the appeal, so that uh, you can you can well, and who were the court reporters because they're going to be the ones who knew who know whether or not there was a, who the court reporter was, and you're gonna need that information for the designations. I think for the vast majority of times, the standard record that the clerk prepares in a final order appeal is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I, it's not that often that I have to issue instructions to the clerk, but sometimes if there's a notice issue or, or a discovery issue or something that could be relevant, that now's a good time to think about it. Right, I will add though that something that is often overlooked is if you do direct the clerk to include something less than the full record, you're actually supposed to file a statement of, of um, what's it called, statement of, of issues to be decided or statement mm -hmm. of issues to be determined. Uh, because then that lets everybody know, hey, uh, 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 these are the very narrow issues that's going to be on appeal. I, to be honest with you, I don't think, I've never seen anybody do that. I only recently did that because I recently realized the importance of that rule when I wasn't even sure my client was in the case because the guy, the other side limited the record so thinly that it didn't seem to apply and then suddenly I get a brief that showed that we were still in this case apparently. <laughs> one of the things that's nice in Florida, one of the things that helps me sleep at night is that Florida courts generally are not going to hold your feet to the fire on record issues. They don't want to decide cases on the basis of an incomplete record. So although you should, it's best to get these things resolved early and get them resolved now, if later on you figure out that there were things that you didn't quite get right, you can usually get that taken care of and the court will supplement the record. People might not be very happy with you and it's not the most efficient way, but, right. but at least uh, you're not likely to lose the case over not paying attention to the record in the beginning, although you certainly should. Uh, what about any, any difference in non-final order appeals? No, in non-final appeals, the, uh, the only thing that I might do as the appellee is when the index to the record on appeal comes in or if the appellant has filed directions that are less than the full amount, then I'll take either I or, or my assistant will take a, a, a copy of the trial docket and we, we will highlight on the trial docket what was included in the index or in the directions. This way then I can get a big picture view of what is missing and whether or not we're going to need it. Uh, and I found that's the most efficient way of determining that. Um, to ter so that then as the appellee, I can file cross directions if I feel like we need to, or s to fix the record if there's something missing later. All right, I think we're gonna skip uh, preliminary motions because those have been covered in such detail earlier. Uh, let's talk about when we start actually preparing the briefs. 
Um, usually we start by looking at the record. Now, do you, can you talk to us a little bit about what you do as far as looking at and analyzing the record? Sure. So I am a big fan of color. So I will highlight and oftentimes as I'm reading the record, by the way, I use it, I do everything digitally, but this obviously could work if you wanted to print off the entire record. Uh, sometimes those records can be uh, two or three five inch binders thick. Uh, that's why I stick to the digital. Um, and what I will do is if I might do a little preliminary research if I'm completely new to the issue just so that I can issue spot as I'm doing it. Uh, the other thing that I might do is read one of the more dispositive motions that, especially after my conversation with trial counsel, trying to identify what are the potential issues that, that he or she thinks are going to be relevant on appeal, just to, so that as I'm reading the appellate record, I can, I can issue spot and also color code the issue. So uh, in other words, if, if there's one issue on uh, uh, a, a a procedural violation, then that's going to get a yellow highlight for as I see that as I'm reading it. And if it's if it's an issue on uh, whether or not there's competent substantial evidence to support X, Y, and Z ruling, then maybe that gets a blue highlight. And I start with the pleadings, and I and then I move to the trans or the pleadings and all of the the miscellaneous uh, 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 record portions prior to trial. And then I that's and then after that is when I review the trial uh, transcript. And I try to go through everything one time, and then I might go back, depending on how big this record is, uh, uh, particularly how big the trial is, after I've highlighted and color-coded, then I might go back through one, and, and made annotations in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, um, margins. I might then go back through uh, and uh, identify by issue the main testimony and who is speaking in a separate Word document, which can become very helpful later when, not only when you're drafting the brief and the facts section particularly, but then in six months when you get ready for oral argument and you gotta try to remember the record and you don't wanna sit down and reread the entire 3,000 page record. <laughs> so having a good summary, you know, sort of doing what uh, uh, um, Brian had said, don't, don't summarize in a brief. Uh, uh, a person's, uh, what one person said and what another person said, and et cetera. That's true for the brief, but having a good summary like that in maybe a bullet point or outline fashion for yourself is a good idea. Yeah. You know, and I would just say, I I'm assuming everybody in this room knows this, but you know, it's, it was not too many years ago when you had to sort of create the, the record to review, or you had to go to the courthouse and look at it. And you know, nowadays, I think, every DCA will send you a PDF of the record. And or you so, can download it. Or you can download it, right. So it's made our lives much easier in that we're all looking at the same record, but it also means we have to spend a little bit of time learning how to use the electronic tools. Mm -hmm. um, Chris is an expert at these kinds of things, but you know, all of these tools, uh, PDF readers, not just Adobe Acrobat, but all, there's all sorts of brands of them. They all have these tools for highlighting, bookmarking, indexing, and it, they're just invaluable. And, and electronic records are not going anywhere, so right. <laughs> we need to figure out how to use those things and use them efficiently because doing stuff on paper just isn't going to cut it anymore. And just to add to that, if you are doing something digitally, which again, I highly recommend, it can be very ha handy at oral argument when you get a question that involves uh, uh, a check on page you know, 3040 of the record, which actually happened to me once at oral argument, and I was able to punch it up real quick. But uh, if you are doing that, the, uh, using a, an iPad or something, the other thing that I like to do, especially in the trial transcript, is I will uh, bookmark key points of the trial. So uh, uh, plaintiff's opening, defendant's opening. You know, create a structure so that you can quickly find it uh, uh, later. Uh, oh, I remember that was uh, in so-and-so's testimony on cross-examination. I don't remember what page, though. Well, if you've got a good file structure or a good bookmark structure, you're going to be able to get to it much faster. Okay. So we've got to keep moving if sure. we're going to get through the whole process. So what, what's next? You, you've, you've digested the record. How do you start the writing process? With the facts, section. I think uh, I echo, let's see, who was it? The, uh, Nancy, I think, said that the facts section is the most important aspect of the appeal uh, and should allow your reader, the judge, to make a decision almost before they, he or she has read your argument. 
Uh, I can't emphasize enough how important the fast section is, and also to do it in a way that is story-like. I mean, briefs are dry enough, and if you can try to have a narrative hook in the beginning, you know, you, you see it in every case. They all start out with, for the most part, this case is about blah, so in, the trial court ruled this, so-and-so argues that, and we disagree. Well, do something similar to that. I mean, don't be argumentative. But that, that at least, if you can encapsulate what this case is about in a very thumbnail perspective, right in the first paragraph of the facts section, and then go into a more detailed discussion in a story form, like tell the story. Don't put a bunch of extraneous facts and dates in there, but if you can make it flow in a way that is engaging, it will, it, it will, the, the, uh, the, the judge will finish your brief. Let's just put it that way. Uh, yeah, from a workflow perspective, I would say I'd do the same thing. I'd draft the statement of facts, statement of the case first, but I would say also I'd draft it first and almost last because, and, and throughout the process, because I draft the statement of facts as to what I think it should be, but then as I work on the brief, I continue to go back to it because maybe there's a certain case that I'm trying to apply and I can, you know, not change my facts, but I can state my facts in a way that makes it more clear that it's applicable, or there's a case I'm trying to get away from so I can kind of shade the facts a different direction. So uh, to me, the statement of facts is always a work in progress, and I always come back to it at the end to make sure that it, it's telling the story that I want to tell. And that it still includes facts that are relevant to your later argument. Right, it's also a good time to remove facts that right. don't, didn't really fit. That you thought sounded good at the time, but after reading the cases, maybe they're not so important. Are you a believer in a, a statement uh, or a citation to the record after every sentence in your statement of facts? I, I am. I'm a very firm believer of pinpoint citing to the record. And by pinpoint citing, I don't mean just identifying, say, uh, so let's say you're talking about a motion to dismiss, and the motion to dismiss is on page 10 through 20. And then you're, you're wanting to talk, hey, this argument was preserved, and then you just cite page 10 through 20. No, identify where in page 10 through, 10 through 20 that argument shows up in. Make, the more you pinpoint cite, the easier it will be for the judge and particularly their staff attorney who has to look all that stuff up, but at least they'll be able to find it. Yeah, I feel like if you're having trouble putting a pinpoint record cite after any sentence in your statement of facts or statement of the case, it's probably argument or it's probably not in the record. Right. right. Okay, uh, what, after the statement of facts, where do you go from there? Well, that's when I start researching more detailed researching. I mean, I may have done some initial researching as I mentioned before I started the facts, but that's when I really kind of get my hands dirty. I've identified probably the main issues from the process of doing the, uh, uh, reviewing the record in the facts section, and then I, I start research, and I am methodical. So it's issue one, issue two, issue three. I, I, I research and then write in individual issues first. Uh, and, and the way I research, I don't start with just plain bullion searches because sometimes your words may not be the exact words that are going to show up in, a, in, in sort of the term of arts, maybe, or the, 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 the judge's terms. Uh, so, some, so usually I try to start with treatises and create a, a, a universe of cases from those treatises that then I, that's what I'll start, I'll, I'll take that universe of, of, of cases and, and read all those. And, and as I'm reading them, I, uh, again, I take meticulous notes, but I'm also highlighting, and Westlaw has a snippet feature, so I'll, I'll snip the uh, uh, you know, case sites or something that I really, you know, the way something is written, et cetera. Well, my mind. <laughs> At the end, I just drop the mic. <laughs> mic drop. I, I, I do something, uh, I'm gonna make an admission here that even though I'm fairly technical and, and like to do a lot of stuff electronically, when it comes to this process, a lot of times I, I save the cases in Westlaw, but I still print them and write at the top what issue I think it applies to and what, you know, where I think it fits in my outline and keep them on my desk. And maybe it's just a little superstitious, like when I find the case that I really want, I don't trust Westlaw to keep it for me. <laughs> and I print it out and make sure that it's on my desk somewhere. And it goes into the file later, you know, so the client ever wants to know what did I spend $20,000 for, at least I have a stock of stuff that I've printed. Jared, do you have a question? Of course you do. I, 
Jared is asking a question about pricing in Westlaw when you save cases, whether there's more additional charges. Yeah. Well, I imagine, and, and I don't know the answer to that directly, but I imagine it depends on your plan. Yeah. But at least under the plan that my firm's negotiated, it's once, once you've saved it and looked at it once, if you're going back to it, it uh, through the fi uh, folder structure, then you're not charged again. Okay. Yeah, I, that's what I was too, but I'm sorry? That's what I thought it was too. But, but I guess if you are being charged, then Dwayne's idea is probably a better idea to print them off. And, and that's certainly the way I, I used to do it before they had that folder structure. And the other thing that I do is I, I, I use a, an app called GoodNotes. And you could do this on, an, on, on a pen and paper too. But I, I will write the case name and a short citation. And then at the very top of the corner, I'll put S slash K, which I'll get to in a minute. And then I might jot out why is that case important and how do I think it's going to help my, my, uh, uh, my case. And the reason why I put S slash K is this for Shepherd Eyes and Keysight. So the really good cases, I'm going to mine that case for more cases to, to expand my universe. And this is all before Boolean searching. And, and then I'm going to Shepherd Eyes that case. Obviously, we have to do that anyway. But we also will find even more cases to add to the universe. And the goal here is to exhaust the research, which at the trial level is often not as important, but at the appellate level, it really is important because you don't want to be in a situation where you didn't find that key case and maybe the other side did, or worse, that oral argument the, the staff attorneys have and the judges point you, uh, uh, you know, highlight that. Um, so uh, that's why I put the S slash K so that I remember to go back and, and, and shepherdize key site, and sometimes I put an M for mine, which means look at the cases they cite and, look, and, and expand from there. I will tell you too, because I, I meant when I said I print out the cases and highlight them, I saw a lot of nodding out there, so I know there's people that do that. But I do, if I'm going back when I'm actually using that case and I want to cite to it or I want to quote something from it, I do go back to Westlaw, and I apologize for this being Westlaw-oriented presentation. Chris and I just happen to be Westlaw users. Um, you can copy with reference from Westlaw, right, and paste that into your brief. So it automatically takes the quote, the citation, you can format it for Florida and put it right into your brief. It really takes a lot of the errors where you transpose numbers or don't get something quite right out because I almost always, anything I put into my brief is coming right out of Westlaw. And I believe Lexus has a feature I like think they, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Yeah. So, and, and um, there was another point. I was, oh, so after I've gone through the, the, the treatises, I've gone through the universe of cases that I've created from those treatises and from themselves, as I'm doing that, I'm identifying what are some possible good search terms. I mean, how are the cases talking about my issue? Uh, and that's when I might, for the cherry on top, unless I really think I've already exhausted everything, that's when I'll probably start doing a couple of bullion searches based on that in order to make sure that I have exhausted this field. All right, and I think we should probably talk about writing, getting started sure. with writing. When do you actually put pen to paper and start writing what, what's going to be your brief? Well, up to this point, the entire process, I am creating an outline. A general, you know, not one of these sort of Brian Gardner details outlines, but a general working outline. Maybe, you know, top level issues. I know I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about that issue and that issue. And then maybe subheadings. Okay, oh, well, I found out that this is a four factor test, so in this one, I'm going to have a, I'm going to need to talk about this factor, this factor, these two factors are already presumed, so I can address that in maybe a roadmap you know, type of thing. So I, I'm, I'm creating an outline that will eventually provide not only the roadmap that I'm going to put in my brief, but also a roadmap for me on how do I draft it. But once I've exhausted the individual issues field of research, that's when I start drafting. And the drafting process for me, I don't know about you all, maybe, maybe there's some, some great writers that just, it's easy, but it's a, it's a blood, sweat, and tears kind of moment. <laughs> I, both in, in how hard I work on it, but also uh, um, in, in, you know, how, how difficult it, it can be to, to produce something that's, that's worthy to turn into the, the court. And so my editing process, I can't just turn off my editor. I, there's uh, some experts out there that say, you know, just turn off your editor and write like a madman and then go back, or a woman, and go back and, and, and uh, edit. But I, I don't do that. I edit as I go. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of 
the writing process is when I really edit, but I, you may want to jump in here. Yeah, I, and I, I do write the same way. I tend to write very slowly and carefully as I write. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the words come to me as I'm writing and I, I don't do like a rough draft like, right. like what you're saying either. Um, when do you write your summary of argument? I, I actually do that last. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's because um, I, I do spend a lot of time on my summary of the argument. I don't spend a lot of time on my conclusion. I kind of try to do what, what uh, um, um, was said earlier, where it's just identify what's the relief. But in terms of the summary of the argument, I feel like I need the entire brief to really know and how to know what I want to say in the summary and how to condense it. Because I'm, I take to heart what the appellate rules say, where they say a summary of the argument should seldom be more than two and never essentially five. So I really try to do it if I can, no matter how big my brief is, I try to condense everything down into about a page. Because especially if it's a long brief, I figure at least they'll read that page. <laughs> I mean, they read the briefs from cover to cover, don't get me wrong, but if I can reduce that, that my uh, 50 page, God forbid I'm at 50, but uh, I try <laughs> to do much less, but if, I'm, if I have to do that every, every once in a while, you have to, to be thorough then at least my summary is going to be as short. And rarely do I ever go over that one page. I, I will tell you what I do. I do my summary of argument last, and I'll tell you how I do it, which I, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever talked about this before, but I actually take my entire brief, I, I copy it and paste it, the substantive part of my brief into another document, and I delete, start deleting and deleting and deleting. So. <laughs> A lot of the sentences in my summary of argument are sentences that appear somewhere else in the brief but have been condensed. And that, that sounds like a cop-out, like, oh, well, that's the easy way to do it, but it's purposeful because if the judges are reading the summary first, I want them to remember those things when they read the argument, oh, I, already, I, I remember that, or vice versa. If they come back to it to refresh their memory afterwards, I want it to sound the same. So I actually take, with, with some differences, and I may modify some sentences because they don't fit, but a lot of times my summary of argument is all sentences that exist in some form in my argument. It also makes it a little easier to prepare. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and I, I sometimes my same sentences will show up as well. Let's see, um, what about proofing? When, when you, once you, you've got to the end, you're getting close to the end, do you have a process for proofing your brief? Yeah, I do. I, um, as I said, I've already started the process as I'm writing, but once I finally feel like I have a good working draft, uh, that's when I will, uh, the first wave is, is reading it through, mostly to try to make sure that the, the structure is there, because I, I, I'm a big proponent of organization. I know that the court is, and make it because an organized person is going to be a, a, is going to be more persuasive than, than a disorganized person. So making sure that I have a consistent flow and organization is important. That's my first wave of editing. Uh, my second wave is is really where and, and sometimes this happens during the first as well, just because I can't help myself. But uh, <laughs> the, the second wave is really where I'm trying to focus on shortening it, shortening it, and uh, 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 you know word choices, etc. The, I used to do a wave of citation checking, but since Westlaw and Lexis now have the ability to just copy and paste it automatically with the correct uh, uh, citations, I spend a little less time on, on doing that because I, I know that that works fairly well. Now, maybe there's a staff attorney that says I should probably work a little harder <laughs> at it, I don't know. But, uh, and then once, so I usually go through about three, three or four drafts. So once I've, I've, I've got that done, I, I actually send it off to the client or trial counsel uh, if they're sophisticated enough particularly, uh, uh, just to let them get a read through. And then uh, I'll do my tables, and then the final read through for last minute, you know, you know, no matter how many times you read this, you're gonna always have some, see some typos. But the final read through, I usually do on an iPad. I actually have to edit in paper. See, the only part of the process that I do on paper is the editing. But I do oh. the final read-through on the iPad just because uh, I know a lot of the judges read it that way. So I want to see, kind of like what Brian had said earlier, I want to see what it looks like on the iPad. I, I have a very similar process. Um, and I could, when I teach students this, I go into a lot of detail. But the gist of it is I, I usually look through a brief when I'm, when I'm proofing it, I look through it five times, mm -hmm. okay? And that gets tough when it's 50 pages. I hate to write a 50-page brief. <laughs> the first time I look through it for structure and flow, 
transitions, big ideas to make sure it makes sense. Then I go through and I do what I call an excessive word edit, and I just take out all the words like Brian Gowdy was talking about, right? That all the words that are unnecessary, sentences maybe two if there are. Then I look at grammar, punctuation, and spelling, like the third time through, the stuff that hasn't been caught. Fourth time through is kind of a blue book edit, just to take a look at those things and make sure that everything is correct. And then the last thing I do is I go through and I check all the quotes um, and check the record sites, you know, right. to make sure that those are still uh, correct. And I always check the quotes last because I've found every once in a while, I'll go through one of these other edits and edit a quote. <laughs> you know, to oh, yeah. make that, that has a grammatical error or ambiguity in it. And then, I, then when I check it, I realize, oh, I shouldn't have changed that. That was a quote, right? So, um, yeah. Before we move on, two quick recommendations that I used to do a lot early on, but uh, uh, I, candidly, I, I don't do as much now. But first off, when you edit, during one of those processes, if you really want to cut words, read your brief backwards. Start with the last sentence and move backwards because you'll, you'll, then you're just focusing on the sentence and whether or not it can be shortened. Uh, and then the other thing, everybody has writing ticks. Find out what yours are, what yours are. Mine is I like to add apostrophe S even if it's not possessive. I don't know why. For some reason, <laughs> I think it looks cool. Uh, I'm sure I have many others. But make sure, and, and one of them is I used to do a lot of passive voice, and it's active is generally better. Uh, so. If you can, if you know your, uh, if you know you have ticks, do find find and replace of those ticks if possible. If, if it if it lends itself to that, or at least read your brief just for your ticks to try to push that weed that out. Any special concerns when you're dealing with a reply brief as an appellant? I hate replies. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, see. I love replies. Yeah. Why do you hate replies? Because. Well, for several reasons. One, I put so much into the appellant, into the uh, initial brief that uh, I've, I'm, I, I'm like, what else is there more to say? Either you believe me or you believe this guy, and that type of thing. Uh, and two, because there's so much time that lapses, I've already forgotten <laughs> everything I knew about the, the, uh, the, the, the whole issue is probably done, has already been forgotten and brain dumped. But uh, uh, in terms of replies, I, I first start with reading my original initial brief. Uh, and then I, I read the, the answer brief. And as I'm reading the answer brief, uh, I'm sure we're all writing notes like, this is crazy, there's no way, you know. But, you know, also try to Big have question a, marks. Yeah, or there's, yeah. you know, this is a dangerous point I need to address. <laughs> Those are really important. You know, be honest with yourself. Are there points you need to address? Particularly, as one of the judges said, address the preservation issues that they point out. Uh, maybe you'll be able to fly under that new uh, 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 second and fourth DCA case that says, hey, it's okay to not have a preserved issue, <laughs> even though it's not fundamental error. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely try to identify where you need, to, where are the soft spots, where are the unaddressed parts, and the soft spots of the, of the, of the uh, uh, Appley's brief that you can attack. And, and try to attack it, and if possible, try to keep it well under the 15 pages. See, I love reply briefs because it's a closed universe, right? All I have to do is, is, is attack the things that came up in the answer brief, and I've only got 15 pages to do it, so I can do something really concise. Um, but I hear what you're saying. The, but, the passage of time is not great. But, and the other thing is, is that you, don't, you, know, you know that that's what, what you need to do is just address, but you can't help but to want to go, okay, this is what I said, this is what he said, and here's why it's wrong. But you really need to just jump into yeah, it. Yeah, because you don't have the time, the space <laughs> right. for that. All right, so we're running out of time. So what about oral argument, Chris? Um, we got plenty of time. He hasn't gotten up yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you always ask for oral argument? No, I don't, actually. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's kind of like what Carrie Ann said, where you know, I feel like I'm a little stronger in the briefing, but, or, or, or if I'm being honest with myself, that's probably true. But also, I think that most cases probably don't need oral argument, uh, especially if you've done your brief right. And if, if, if there really is questions, then the court will probably set it on its own. Uh, so I gen as the, as the uh, appellee, I generally never ask for oral argument unless I see something in the, in the reply brief that just has to be answered. As the appellant, I might give a little more consideration to it, but uh, uh, generally, especially if they have a cost-conscious client, I generally try to discourage it. And I, I know you have a very detailed way that you prepare for OA, and I don't know if we, it's all addressed in the podcast, 
Uh, I don't know if we have time to talk about that, but you want to talk just generally about how you prepare? Sure. Um, I think Sarah had said she starts about two weeks in advance. I, I try, I, I, that's probably the earliest I would start, but generally I'm about four or five days in advance because I don't want to peak too early, basically. I want to try to be running at all steams on the case uh, by the time that OA hits. And if I go too early, then, then uh, uh, I, I will, for one, I'll get disrupted with other things. Um, and, I, and the other thing I do is I actually have, so when I start preparing, I, I start by opening four documents on my, on my uh, computer. I create a, a Word document that is the detailed outline of the briefs, another Word document titled Legal Authorities, a third one called Potential Questions and Answers, and a fourth one is my, is my speaking outline. So in the first one, I start by rereading the briefs, and I, fo I, read, I try to read them the way most, at least in the second DCA, maybe some of the other DCAs are a little different, but I try to start, I try to read them issue by issue, and I outline them. Because that outlining process, for me, helps, one, remind me what this case is about, because there's been many months since the last brief was filed, and two, uh, helps me really get into the case again uh, and identify what are some potential trends in our issues. Uh, and then, and I outline them in the order of the issues uh, as they were presented. So it'll be uh, issue one's uh, initial answer and reply, issue two's initial answer and reply. As I'm doing that, I'm completing the other, the, the second two documents, which is the table, or excuse me, which is the outline of authority. So I'm identifying the key cases, I'm doing a little short, little shorthand version of the case site and a brief two or three, two or three sentence uh, summary. And, and I'm also reading those cases. And then as I'm doing that, I'm also trying to think, what are some questions and answers that I'm gonna potentially get? Uh, uh, well, obviously, I'm not gonna get the answers, but what are some potentially questions that I'm gonna get and what are answers, what are stock canned answers that I can come up with? And a lot of times these canned answers are probably stuff that I would mention anyway in, my, uh, in, in, the, in the fourth document, which is the detailed outline, or excuse me, which is the, the speaking points outline. So after I'm done with the detailed outline is when I sort of condense everything down into a two-page, kind of like this, outline. Um, and I use color also, because that helps transition the eyes if I needed an oral argument uh, for, to, to, to look down at it. Uh, so that's primarily, uh, uh, that's a very nutshell version of what, how I prepare. You can tell Chris is so attached to this iPad, he's literally attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, yeah. yeah. It's on my hand. <laughs> what about the day of argument? I'm gonna violate a cardinal rule of cross-examination here by asking you a question I don't know the answer to. Uh, do you have any superstitions or any things that you do every day and before an oral argument? Well, Lucky my, socks or my anything? My superstitions start the night before. I, I have to, I always drive, so I'm in Naples and I always drive, every, every time I have an OA, I'm generally driving somewhere, unless they happen to be sitting in Naples, which happens once a year, uh, which I usually get scheduled for OA during that. But, <laughs> uh, so I, I drive up the night before uh, because I don't need the stress of traffic and you know, we ha I had one trial attorney, a trial judge who was sitting by designation at the second, he said he drove up the, the morning of and he had a flat tire. And he, when he called the court, they, uh, they said, no worries, we'll wait for you. Well, they're not gonna wait for me, so I'm gonna go up the night before. Uh, and, I, and the most important thing in the night before for me is a, a, a good dinner. All right, go somewhere, you know, maybe not spend a ton of money, but spend a little money, maybe grab a very light beer or a little wine or something just to relax and, and, and go to bed early. And then the next morning, one of my big superstitions is I have to practice it at least twice before uh, uh, I go to court. And I usually practice it in front of a mirror. I never moot. Uh, if it was a big, big case in front of the Supreme Court or, or the 11th Circuit, maybe I would, but uh, it's just usually time and money and, and I don't usually have a lot of uh, other appellate attorneys that could moot, but I reiterate what everybody said. If, if you are, are volunteering for a case and you, you want to moot, definitely contact Joe. He'll organize something. Yeah, um, yeah. We've talked important. about that. I don't get to do the opportunity to do that very much either, but it is helpful when right. you can do it. Okay, we have like two minutes left. So what about the day of when you go to argument? What, what do you bring with you? And I'm guessing everybody here already knows. <laughs> this. Uh, pretty much that's it. Well, actually, not, that's not true. I usually take a, a, a Redwell, and in it we'll have this, and it'll also have stickies and a pen. 
uh, because I found, and this was actually a recommendation by a very experienced trial attorney, that if I'm sitting at the table, especially if I'm the appellant, and the appellee's talking, and I'm only going to have two minutes maybe, because we all go a little longer than we, we, we maybe ask for five, but we all go a little longer, and, and we only get two minutes left on that rebuttal. So I'll take a, the, the main points that I hear the, the appellee say that I need to address is what I write on a sticky, and I'll do one sticky per point. This way, I can put it right on the cover, and as I'm talking about it, I just rip it right off, and I've already said it. So those are the main things I bring with me, the iPad and the sticky. You really are an enigma. You're arguing off an iPad with, with sticky notes stuck to the screen. That's true, yeah, <laughs> that's true. The, the only other thing I would say is if you're not brave enough like Chris to take an iPad to oral argument, which I, I would love to do, but I'm, I'm, we've got some security software at the firm and all that, the, the iPads lock, and I just don't know that I would trust it. But I would encourage you to consider just going up with just a notebook. I take a notebook with just a few of the key documents and my outline. Um, there was discussion before about whether you roll in the wheelie bag with the entire record, and there's no time for that. Right. You know, you're never, you're never going to look up something in a box in the record when a judge is waiting for an answer, right? So I would encourage you to get used to just going up with just an outline uh, and, and working off that. I let, me, think, let, me jump, go ahead. let me jump in there, because when, when I did go up there without an iPad, it would, I would always have a... Uh, this, it was a folder that had dividers inside it. And, and, and on, I would open it up on the inside, the first inside cover would be one outline and another outline. Actually, I cheated, I tried to keep it to two pages, but I would cheat and have it legal so you could put a little bit more on it. But I also used larger font so that I could actually see it at the podium because I can't see much. Uh, and then on, and when you turn the page, the, ins, the next inside cover is my table of authorities, or you know, my, author my key sites that I've, I've identified, and maybe a couple of key facts that I, I've created a, a single sheet if, if I think that's going to be important. And then and you turn it over, and this is the one that you're never going to get to, but it's helpful to have with you, is, for me at least, I've got my detailed outline of the briefs. I don't even need the briefs. I've already detailed outlined them. So that's what I'm reviewing sort of on my own the night before or morning of, uh, and then I also have my question and answers where I've tried to predict what questions I might get in the stock answer. So that's how I would do it in paper form. So if this is helpful to you, there's a lot more discussion, like I said, on the podcast. Uh, 12 and 15 are parts 1 and 2. Chris and I talk about all this stuff in a lot more detail. But I hope that gave you something to think about and it was helpful. And we're at 6 o'clock and Ooh. we won't keep you. I could drop the mic now? <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> okay.